my folks uh, were farmers and in the wintertime they had some time off so they could get out and work in, the, in California. And I was just, my folks went down, my mother went down there and uh, I was born there in San Bernardino. And I lived there about two weeks and then came home. So I was born in California, but I, I grew up in Clearfield, Utah. I built model airplanes when I grew up and, and I liked to fly them. Uh, we had a, a church group a fellow that had just fl checked out in a J3 Cub and he, he one day asked us if we'd like to go for a ride in his airplane. And of course, I was willing to go any place for an airplane ride. And so we ended up in a J3 Cub and, and, and I thought that was just the greatest thing. Bernard Fisher began his military career in the Navy near the end of World War II. He served in the Idaho Air National Guard after college before eventually enlisting and earning his wings in the U.S. Air Force. In 1965, Fisher and four other pilots from his squadron volunteered to serve in Vietnam. On March 10, 1966, Fisher and his wingman were flying their World War II vintage A1EH Sky Raiders in the vicinity of the Aschau Valley near Laos. A U.S. Special Forces camp had been overrun by a superior North Vietnamese force and required assistance. But the narrow approach was dotted with lethal anti-aircraft emplacements and was enshrouded in dense cloud cover. We got diverted from a mission to Kontum into the Aschau area. And so we took our airplanes up on top and went in and went in the sky so we could see the, the North Vietnamese had moved in on the camp. They made it through the night, but they, they, were, they weren't going to make it. But when we arrived in the area, they, they told us to, to, to divert to, to the strike aircraft and to get in and help them if we could. And so we, 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 we began probing the areas, trying to find a place to get down. You know, you can see a mountain with snow on it over here, but you couldn't see the bottom of the clouds. And, and then I, saw, I spotted the, a break in the clouds and I knew where we was at. So I called and said, I know where we're at. And so this flight turned and came back with uh, the two of us. And we went in, the four of us just lined up in trail, went out through the hole down on the deck and into the Indashaw area. And we switched over to the FM radio, which is a radio that you can directly talk to the person on the ground. And he, he said, uh, there's three mortar bunkers there that belong to the Vietnamese and to the Americans. And he said, you could uh, hit anything in the camp except that mortar bunker. It's, it had our friendlies in it. So I made a left turn and came down the, the final approach and right over the camp. And, I had four cannons on the line and I just hosed them down and cleaned the line off. And the idea is to straighten them down and make them get up and get out of there or they're going to get hit. And so Paco, my wingman, he slid over and he straightened the ground. And, and, and then Joe Myers, this other guy that was leading the flight, leading his flight, he, he slid over to straighten. He strafed on the way in and as he pulled off, they hit him. And he caught on fire and, and he was burning pretty badly. So he hit the steel matting, which is the runway skidded about 800 feet, went off the right side, hit the bank, and blew up. I watched for a moment, I called the command post, the big rear airplane, said we had a pilot down and he was probably killed in the crash, because he was really burning, he just did a ball of fire. And about that time, the fire kind of blew away from the right side of the airplane, and he came out across the wing and dove into the ditch, and hit the ground, went on, on his knees. And I seen him run, and I went right after him, went right over his head. Pulled up, he went right in front of him. He waved back, and I called and told him we, we, we needed some help, and we needed a helicopter. After being assured that a rescue helicopter was on its way, Fisher rejoined the fight. But 10 minutes later, with the situation on the ground growing steadily worse, there was still no sign of the promised chopper. That's about the time that uh, I realized that we had to get him out of there some way because he wouldn't make it otherwise. I knew the runway was short. I could tell it was would, would look pretty bad for the airplane. And I called the command post, and that's when they said they, the runway is 3,500 feet long, and that, that made me feel good because I can land in 3,000 feet. But it was a mistake. The runway is only 2,500 feet long, and it's too short for the runway. But we made the decision. And, uh, I got some comments about not going in, and, but I felt it was necessary to do that. Okay, 
I, I came through the smoke and the fire of the camp and, and touched it down about 95 knots. And I just boom hit the ground and skidded and skidded. I was off on the runway and on the runway and, and uh, until I got to the end of the runway and then realized that I couldn't stop it. But I just run out of runway and run out of brakes. And they were red hot. I was really cooking them. I damaged the right wing and the right tail section. And I got it turned around and got a taxi back on the runway. And I taxied down the runway about eight, 800 feet. And uh, when I did, he jumped up and waved his hands and I spotted him and uh, I hit the brakes. And, and he made a run for the airplane. But I, I became aware about that time that they were hitting me and uh, I was taking quite a few rounds. And so I watched for just a moment and he didn't make it. And I felt perhaps he probably got hit trying to get to the airplane and he was probably down someplace. So I locked the brakes and crawled out of the airplane and went over, in order to get him. I felt real strong about it. I just felt that we had to do it. And I called the command post and told them I was doing it. I didn't ask him, I just told them I was doing it. And it worked. We crawled up on the side of the wing, put his head and arms in the cockpit, and I, I, I just jumped up and straddled him, put one leg on each side of the cockpit and pulled. Pull him in head first right into the cockpit. We didn't even strap in. We just, I slid down on the seat and spun her around and gave it all the throttle she had. I thought we were in pretty serious trouble, but the airplane came off the ground. I don't think we would have got him back if we didn't have. They didn't. Uh, they weren't taking any prisoners. But uh, he survived. Uh, his name was Dafford Myers. He, he he just got promoted to lieutenant colonel that morning. And he said he didn't think he'd ever put, pin those eagles on his shoulder. I didn't know much about the medal at the time, and I still probably don't know as much as I should. But uh, it's a great feeling to know that you're recognized for what you've done, and it represents a lot of other people. A lot of, a lot of people were involved in that battle that day. Well, I think that the Americans are compassionate and will do most anything reasonable to help somebody who's in trouble. Any one of those guys could have had an excuse for not going in there, but uh, it's important that you you respond to your feelings, I think, when the time comes forward.